Curry from the- uh, Hold on a sec, hold on a sec. Good evening, everyone. My name is Timothy Gager and welcome to Virtual Friday's Dire Literary Series. Uh, tonight, my feature is Mr. Ron Tanner. And uh, let me tell you a little bit of something about uh, Ron here. Um, and there he is. Um, okay. What you can do is instead of you know me reading the entire bio, definitely go to ronaldtanner.com and you'll find out all about his life here. You can find out about his farm here. And if you're a writer, you can go on the writer's retreat, which I did. And it's absolutely uh, lovely. And in fact, I did a dire literary series right from this location. And I did it right there. So uh, you can stay at Ron's farm. It's a wonderful place to stay. And it's a great place to write. And um, what, what else do I got here? Uh, there's all kinds of things to check out on, on rontanner.com and you can also check out his books. But uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Ron and then we'll be asking him some questions. So without anything else from me, uh, Ron Tanner. Thanks, Tim, great to be with you. And thank you folks for joining us. <clears throat> I'm gonna read uh, from the first story in the collection. It's um, called Winnemucca and that's a town in um, Nevada, Northern Nevada. And this is about uh, life on the road for musicians on the casino circuit, which is something I used to do. <clears throat> this is from a woman's point of view. So um, use your imagination. I'm sure you're good at that. Um, it's called Winnemucca. I pounded on Nancy's door for several minutes before I tried the knob. The door was unlocked. As I entered, a cold wind blew in behind me, pushing my skirt tight between my legs. I could smell creosote and sage. I pictured tumbleweeds rolling and bouncing, bullied by the wind. I'd come to tell Nancy that Pepper was MIA. I'd just seen her fiddle for sale in the local pawn shop. I made a habit of checking the pawn shops because Pepper was always hawking something. Without a fiddle, we didn't sound much like a country band. We had been gigging two weeks at Winnemucca's Tamok Casino. Nancy joked that Winnemucca was Indian for where the fuck are we? I didn't like being on the road. I, I tried to quit six months back, but here I was again, halfway across Nevada. When I'd left Kai in Berkeley, he said, why do you want to live this way? All I could do was shrug, then kiss him hard on the mouth as if that would hold him. Nancy was sprawled on her stomach across the bed like she had landed there after falling from a great height. White blonde hair fanned neatly across her bare back. She had her jeans on, but no shoes. Nancy? Her, sm her room smelled of baby powder and puke, a tinge of mildew, too. The puke smell could have been anything. It didn't mean she was bulimic or drinking, problems that had dogged her for years. She was 35, still holding tight to the look of a late 20-something. The wind kicked up a dust devil outside the uncurtained window. I could see blue-gray mountains in the distance. This was high desert but not the pretty kind you'd find in Arizona or New Mexico. Nevada landscape in these parts was underfed and scrubby as a coyote. I stepped closer, then grabbed the cool heel of Nancy's left foot. Nancy jerked awake and rolled over so quickly, I jumped back. Jesus, girl. Her face was swollen from sleep, a strand of two blonde hair stuck to her lower lip. A big block of midday sunlight fell through the open door behind me and lit up the mess of Nancy's room. You wouldn't answer, I said. I was pounding. Sure, pounding, she said. That's what drummers do. You all right? I was writing. She glanced around for something lost, then pulled the t-shirt from the tangle of sheets. You want to hear it? We don't have time, I said. Nancy was no songwriter, but that didn't stop her from trying. Nearly every musician I knew was the same. Writing songs was like playing the slots. Maybe you'd get lucky. Everyone has time for a love song, she said. Pepper hawked her fiddle. Nancy grimaced as she squirmed into her t-shirt. She's such an asshole. Other times, Pepper had hawked her turquoise studded belt, her 10 gallon hat, her silver bangles, or her diamond ear stud, even her backup bow, but never her fiddle. I used to think if I was a band leader, I'd never hire a flake. But now, 29, I'd come close to realizing that most people are flaky. Pepper was a good player. She remembered the arrangement. She didn't have an attitude on stage, but 
we were always running after her off stage. Nobody has it all. That's the thing. No matter who you are, there's going to be a hole in your program. So it was with Kai. I loved him to death, but he was killing me. I was on the road because he couldn't pay the rent. He knew that, and yet he blamed me for going on the road. You've gone on like this too long, my mother told me on the phone that morning, but it's not too late. Ten years before, when I'd refused a scholarship to the College of Sequoias, I'd crushed her dream. Unlike Mark, my older brother, I had no patience for classrooms. I'd never been able to keep my hands still. We're in a recession, she said, and all you know how to do is drum. I knew plenty. How to tune up my antique VW van, how to make killer cauliflower casserole, how to housebreak a basset hound, how to run 10 miles without choking, how to repair my wardrobe with needle and thread, how to build a bookcase with reclaimed pallet wood, how to speak enough Spanish to order the really good food from taco trucks, how to scour a flea market for a collectible silver spoons. See, plenty. Still, I held my hot little phone to my ear and took it in as I'd always taken it from mom. Think about it, Rainy, who's gonna hire you? Nancy would hire me. I'd been in Nancy's road bands off and on for five years. I said to Nancy, you know, it's the slots. Oh, fuck me, Nancy said. She pulled on her boots. Nancy dry smoked a generic cigarette in the passenger seat as I drove my VW bus to Main Street. Downtown was hardly more than a scatter of buildings hunkered by a shallow river. Across the river, Winnemucca Mountain rose from the scrubby desert, treeless and crabby, craggy, blemished with white patches of snow. It was probably bigger than it looked. On the other side was the Sonora Range, huge and intimidating. I-80 sluices straight through Winnemucca, population 7,396. The, th the flashiest part was Casino Row, a short stretch of neon enticements for fast food, gas, and gambling. There were nine casinos. By the time we got to the last one, it was 4.30. We were due on stage at 7. Fuck, said Nancy for the millionth time. Fuck, fuck, fuck. When we found Pepper, she was with a man named Le Levon Little. He raised the Stetson off his head when Pepper introduced us. He was cowboy lanky, but pale as cake flour, with black hair that kept falling over one eye. His eyes were a dewy blue-gray and could have belonged to a kindergarten teacher. He said he was a chef at Tim Elk Casino, though I'd never seen him. Pepper wouldn't stop playing her machine even as we talked. Her fingers were black from coins. She was down to a bucket of nickels. Pepper looked 16 even though she was 26. She had straight black hair down to her waist and a wide doll-like face. Everywhere she went, there was a man in her wake. It didn't matter that back in Berkeley, she was married and had a seven-year-old daughter. Gig starts in two hours, Nancy said. She was staring at the back of Pepper's pretty head. Right, Pepper said, yanking the slot arm. She was fond of the old machines, which were easy to find in small towns like Winnemucca. Nancy turned to Levon and said, why'd you let her hawk her fiddle? Levon blinked in confusion. I just got here. I said, Pepper, we've got to get your fiddle. She smiled sweetly at me. Would you do that? You've got to go with us, I said. I can't leave my machine, she said. It's about the burp. Fuck me. Nancy said. I saw Levon look at her with interest. Nancy turned to him and said, I'm not talking to you, cowboy. I'm a chef, he said. Nancy pulled Pepper's free arm. Ouch, Pepper said. Come the fuck on, Nancy said. I said, give Pepper three more pulls, Nancy, then we'll go. Why three, Nancy said. It's an even number, I joked. Levon wagged a long finger at me. I turned to him. Did you say you're a chef? He nodded yes. Pepper had a very fluid motion, coined a slot, pulled the arm, wait for the spin, then coined a slot, and so on. I'm not going anywhere, she said. I pulled out my cell and dialed her house in Berkeley. I said, I'm calling Tiffany, her daughter. Stubb, her husband, answered, what? It's Stubb, I said. I don't want to talk to Stubb, she said. He wants to talk to you, I said. In my ear, Stubb said, no, I don't. Is she stepping off again? Nancy said to Levon. You don't want to get mixed up in this. Levon said, I'm not mixed up in anything. Then he winked at me like we shared a secret. I felt my ears burning where the phone was. I thought of microwaves coursing through my head. This was autumn 2008. Nobody had smartphones yet. I'm not leaving this machine, Pepper said. Suddenly, Stubb was weeping in my ear. She's cheated on me again, isn't she? I hated myself for pulling him into this. A band is like a family in all the worst ways. It's not like that, I told him. Though I wasn't sure what I meant by it and that. 
Pepper was promiscuous. We all knew. Pepper said, you shouldn't have called him, Rainy. You're such a mother hen. Then she took my phone, pausing only for a moment in her play. She said, honey, I'm hot on the slots is all. I'll be done in a minute. Then life will return to normal. Stop it. She waited, then stop. She waited some more. Then I love you, bunny bear. She waited, then yes, I do. She waited some more, then I do, bunny bear. Then she handed the phone back to me as if it were a bar of soap. I felt like an idiot. Was I a meddlesome mother hen? And I'll stop right there. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Ron. Um, I was uh, just typing something. Uh, where are people going to ask their questions here in the chat on the Zoom? So, Ron, a wonderful story, wonderful collection. And uh, this collection won uh, the, the Elixir Prize for uh, in a contest. Um, so are you a uh, believer in contests? Uh, you also had a book that won in 2006 and was published. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I do believe in contests. You know, it's a really tough... Well, you're the exception, Tim, because you're so prolific and you manage to publish all this stuff. But for the most part, people like me really struggle to get published. And um, and the only way I can get a, a it seems I can get a short story collection published is through a contest. And I think um, we have probably twelve to fifteen national contests a year, and uh, I think they're fairly um, I think they're fairly well run. But I'll, I'll be honest, I think um, once you reach a certain level of competence, a contest is like a lottery, you know, like me and like a hundred other writers had, we all had good collections. In fact, I know a writer who uh, came in second in this collection and he's really, really good. And I thought, wow, it, you know, what it comes down to once they get to the finalists, it's just what the judge feels like, you know, feels like is right for the judge. Um, and it just so happened I got a judge who lives in the West and who kind of has a thing for the West. And that's why she chose this over that other guy's novel um, or short story collection. So, um, uh, so I don't pretend that, you know, winning a contest for me is a big deal. It, I'm just grateful <laughs> that I can get a book out of it. That's, that's the main thing. Well, I mean, it's very, very humble to say the guy that came in second had a great book. You know, don't you feel that, you know, winning that contest, that your book is on that level? Oh, yeah, my book is good. I mean, I'm really proud of this collection. I mean, I've been I've been sitting on this, these stories and, and, and uh, 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 these stories have won awards and stuff. Um, I don't you know, I don't shy away from saying, no, these are damn good stories <laughs> because um they're the best of what I have. And I, and I've been, I've been working on them for, you know, at least 10 years. So, um, but by the, by the same token, um, it could have been any one of like, I don't know, 20 other writers and, and it would have been just as good a collection and people would have said, yeah, this is great. And I would have yet, yet again, been sending this out to uh, more contests. So, yeah. Well, in 2012, you drove out west in one of those super sleeper vans and, uh, you know, you saw the country. Uh, were any of the stories in this current collection inspired by your trips on the road? Yeah, you know, I, I was actually born in California, but raised on the East Coast. Then after uh, college, I went back to California and actually my father's parents were um, were farm workers. Uh, and they um, uh, they lived in tents until my father was in high school. So it's a very colorful past on that side. So California and uh, the West is really deeply rooted in my family. So when I went back after college, I lived in um, the San Joaquin Valley, uh, Central Valley. And then I lived on the coast, uh, lived in San Francisco. Then I moved to Berkeley. Um, and I traveled around quite a bit. And then... Um, Yes, uh, I revisited all of that. Uh, I left um, in the 80s, uh, Berkeley in the 80s, uh, went to grad school and all that. But um, so I lived there for about seven years or so. Really, really loved uh, California and, and the West. And I hated, I hated, I hated Nevada. I just hated Nevada because I was on the casino circuit. I was a musician. I was traveling around in a van and it just sucked. I mean, we just, we played long, long hours, um, you know, in the corner of casinos, smoke filled casinos. People were just idiots, you know, um, um, and, and we also did the, the honky tonk circuit. And I tell you, you know, a lot of people don't know this about um, California, but California is really um, 
it, 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 on the, only on the coast do you find the liberal hipsters. Everywhere else in California, it's like Oklahoma. And people don't understand this. I mean, you have a huge influx of, of uh, uh, Latin American people, uh, Mexicans in particular, who are doing all the work. Uh, but, uh, but also you have people from Arkansas, Oklahoma, Arizona, all living there. And there's a huge circuit of country, you know, country music clubs. And we played, uh, uh, I was in a country music band. Um, and we Originals played or, uh, other people's songs, uh, other people's songs, just cover band. Uh, and, um, actually I was in other bands too, but mostly this, uh, and we played the, I mean, oh my God, some of the places we played, oh my God. Uh, you know, you could smell the bathroom from the stage. I mean, it just reeked of piss and beer. And, you know, and I went home just smelling a smoke. Everything I had just smelled of cigarette smoke. This is back in the 70s and early 80s. Um, it was just unbelievable. Anyway, to answer your question, yeah, I went back on a, on a, on a book tour, a DIY book tour in my camper van um, and just revisited all of that. And I've got a lot of friends in California and, and have been back uh, a number of times, but uh, Arizona, Nevada, and this time I love Nevada, you know, now that I don't have to work the casinos and all that scene is gone, you know, the, the, the music scene is just gone. Uh, but it was quite an adventure. It's really interesting stuff in in retrospect. Um, but I, I have a great fondness for the West. We got a question from John. What do you spend per year in entry fees for contests? Good question. Um, probably close to five hundred dollars, maybe. Um, if I'm active, you know, if I'm active, I'm not so active this year. But if I'm really hitting the contest. And like I say, uh, half these stories are one contest, and that's for every contest I might win, that's um, anywhere from five to twenty dollars per contest. And I, you must enter maybe 10 contests per story. So if I've got like eight stories here that have won contests or come, you know, come close to winning, um, you know, you start doing the math, that's a lot of money. And um, but I can't I can't begrudge the contest for charging money. Um, because they're usually very small presses. They need, you know, they need some income and, um, and they usually do a good job, but you're right. If I, I, I hear the subtext, which is, wow, you know, this is not easy. This costs money. Um, and uh, a lot of people can't afford, you know, to, to play the game. And, and, and that's, you know, I don't know what to do about that, but you know, that's, that's America. Now, uh, as a musician, getting gigs and performances and being in front of people, how did that experience help you in the literature world? Well, as a musician, you see a lot and you meet a lot. Uh, 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 you see a lot of scenarios, really strange scenarios. You see a lot of strange people. Um, you're, um, you're talking to people all the time. You know, you've got to be polite and you really can't be an asshole. So that means you have to engage and um, you also have to judge uh, because, you know, uh, there's always scams out there. So like when I step off stage, there might be somebody there to sell me a symbol that he stole from another club, you know, or some, you know, some material. There might be um, a person who really wants to get on stage and, and sing or something uh, and you have to talk them down because, uh, most places don't allow that for obvious reasons. Um, you, you know, you become a karaoke band and, you know, you have people you're flocking to the stage to sing. You know, you can't have that. Um, sometimes you'll have somebody who wants to pick you up for some reason. Um, you know, so there's a whole list of, of different kinds of characters you're dealing with on a nightly basis. Um, and uh, the, the burnout factor can get real high if you're doing a lot of touring, you know, um, uh, that's a, that's a lot of, you know, I, I did a lot of sleeping just through the day, just to get enough strength to go, you know, another night, uh, in, in the clubs. So, um, but I think it did help, uh, because, uh, put you in the world in a way that makes you very vulnerable, uh, but also makes you very aware of the diversity of, of, of hu humanity, uh, that's out there as opposed to being holed up in your room writing, you know, so I was always writing on the road. I actually had a Hermes typewriter, manual typewriter that I would, <laughs> I would type on in my bed uh, um, during the day. And then, uh, then I'd go out and jog in the desert 
for an hour or so and then i come back and nap for two hours and then i would go to the gig so that's pretty much how i how i spent my time out there right. jeffrey has a question have you ever had a difficult time with the subject subjectivity of uh judges and uh your stories being judged yeah you know um you know we got to be honest about this which is you know, um, we see a lot of awards granted to people and, you know, sometimes you just say, wow, um, you know, there are a lot of writers who are better than that one. And, or they're like, you know, I can see why they would pick that one over another one because of the political scene or that's the PC thing to do. There's a lot of reasons why, you know, people win, um, you know, awards that, that, don't necessarily have to do with the, the writing. Um, and uh, again, that's the scene. Uh, we know how that is. Uh, I think, you know, the best I can do is just accept it. Um, you know, I, I've, I, I've gotten mine in some ways and in other ways, you know, I know that there's some gigs I can never get because of, you know, who I am. Um, there, there are some contests I will never win. I know that. And in fact, um, the recent NEA, this is something I did, which is really stupid. Um, the recent NEA I submitted to um, and um, didn't get it. Uh, and this is what happens. What happens is I get onto a story or a novel that I start and I'm just so excited about it. I got to send it out. It's not ready. It's not, it's nowhere near ready, uh, but I really got to send it out. So like, you know, so I, I started writing this draft of a novel, which is way, way, way years from being uh, 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 ready. But I just was so excited about it. I sent it out. And then um, after I didn't win, I said, well, I know why I didn't win. Number one, it was just too raw. But number two, um, you've got to be careful with the subject matter that you've got going. And I got some really politically hot stories that I think can get people's attention, but I also have a lot of stories that are just fun, you know, they're just, and that's not what, you know, and I sent what was really fun stuff to the NEA this last time. And I realized when I talked to Steve Allman, he won an NEA and I know why, because of, he sent an excerpt from this book, which is very politically uh, uh, um, pointed. It's very, very, uh, very now, uh, uh, very much, in accord with what the zeitgeist now and i said well of course you won for an excerpt from that book and of course i couldn't win for the excerpt from my raw book because number one it was too raw but number two it was just too light and so the, sometimes you know you've got it you've got to kind of scope out you got to scope out uh where you're sending this to if it's a contest or 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 uh, you know some competition because um uh, I should have sent something that was polit politically hot. I should have sent something that was already done, really, really well done. And I had a couple of stories in here I could have done, um, but I didn't. So um, in answer to your question, again, to uh, get back to you know your point, which is um, some of it's political. You know, Some of the awards are political. Some of the awards have to do with who knows who or who knows what's going, you know, who knows what's hot and what's, you know, what's going to get them attention. Um, and uh, that's just a part of the scene. And that's going to be a part of, I think, any scene. And we just have to accept that. Ron, I have a question for you. Hold on, Steve. Steve, put it in the chat, please. Oh, Thanks. I can't. Oh, all right. Sorry. Because uh, okay. I, I have a lot of things that I want to cover with Ron. So no worries. Sure. It's just, a, ask... just kind of a light joke anyway. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask, otherwise it goes off the rails if I just, if everyone opens up their microphones and I, I can't do it. Um, yeah, I just can't type. I'm okay. All set. Uh, uh, so I do have uh, some, a lot of stuff that I want to, I want to cover uh, with you, Ron. Um, you, you have a, a nonfiction book from Animal House to Our House, which is about um, renovated a frat house into a Victoria. You have a book that's a high, more of a hybrid, Kiss Me Stranger. Yeah. You have a novel, uh, Missile Paradise. Do you feel you've got to get into a different mindset? I lost the last bit of that. Oh, do you feel that you have to get into a different mindset to write into those different forms? Yeah. Um, it... Um, 
you know, that's actually one of one of the things that holds me back is I don't have one kind of thing that I like to write. Um, and a lot of editors and agents, you know, want you to be in a niche, and I'm really not in a niche. Um, I write what catches my attention. So in answer to your question, um, yeah, it depends where I am in life and what's going on. So like with the with the hybrid novel, um, I had written some stories and they'd gotten some attention and they were kind of near future um, scenarios and, and they were a lot of fun. And I was just having fun and I like to doodle. And I thought, well, look, I'm not a good enough artist to, 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 to do these drawings, but if I make the story, part of the story that, the, the, it's actually about a, a, a woman in, uh, who's trying to survive with her 12 children and her husband's off fighting this civil war. Uh, so she's alone with her 12 children. I thought, okay, each one of these children can draw a picture. And so the, the pictures will be uh, 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 according to their ages. So some will be really crude and some will be really refined. Uh, and I just want to have fun with that. And, uh, and I put that together um, and I did that. Um, to, that's just where I was, you know. Uh, um, when it comes to nonfiction, I love writing nonfiction. That memoir about uh, the uh, redoing the frat house, uh, which my, my my then girlfriend and I um, bought this uh, wrecked frat house. I mean, so it was just about condemned property, and we didn't know anything about fixing up houses. But she really wanted the house, and I really wanted her, so I bought the house. And it was, it was such a, I mean, God, it turned our lives upside down. You could imagine, well, I had to get that. I had to get that story down. There was just so much to say there about love and about, you know, taking risk and, and, uh, and it was an adventure. Um, and so I had to get into, you know, I had to capture that piece of my life, which was, um, and, and, and so that worked out and, and, um, but you got to be in that place. Uh, I was in that place because I had just done it. I was just living in that house. I couldn't do it now. If I was trying to go back and write that, it's, it's not fresh anymore. It's not, it's not right there. So I'm writing a book, another nonfiction book now about taking on this farm. And I've been writing this book for seven years because that's how long we've been here. So it's huge. Uh, but I've got to keep on chronicling this because uh, it won't be fresh for long. And so... Um, that's that's a different kind of adventure so yeah um in order to write the novel that 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 i'm i've got on the table um i'm gonna have to get in a certain headspace i'm not there right now um i'm waiting for when i can get back to that headspace i mean i gotta start on it but now i just put it aside because too many things are happening too many other places so i uh, definitely got to get um got to get in the right in the right frame of mind well, I love the memoir and the issue behind it because, uh, you know, I'm a failure at even installing a thermostat. So I guess there's no love for me. But what I want to say is uh, with that, um, the Good Contrivance Farm, I want to wrap up our little Q&A with the Good Contrivance Farm because it's a remarkable place. Now, when you decided to restore it, did you have a vision of it as a riding mecca or is it just like, I want to restore this beautiful farm? Yeah, um, well, what happened was, um, we, you know, we'd been in, in Baltimore, in, in the city. That we were doing the whole city life thing. We had this gorgeous, big old brownstone that we'd fixed up. And it was really, uh, 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 really a social hub in, in Baltimore. We had big parties and it was just a different life. But, you know, um, after being there for 15 years, I started feeling claustrophobic. And I wanted, and, 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 you know, I wanted something different. And I wanted another project. And that project was totally done. We couldn't do any more to that house. So um, we started looking for, you know, we figured, okay, let's second mortgage this house and buy a little piece of property in the country. And uh, maybe we can put a travel trailer on it and just go there on weekends. And we looked and we couldn't afford anything and everything sucked. And, and finally we gave up and we were driving back to Baltimore um, and uh, we passed a, 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 an abandoned farm. And uh, I said, I said to Jill, turn around, let's go look at that. And, and we did, and we went down this tree line uh, road to this really cool brick farmhouse, uh, very dressy farmhouse, and, uh, and a ruined farm behind it. And we just checked it out. And, you know, my mind is just firing, just firing, because now we were really experienced at rehabbing houses, and we had 
you know, we had all these resources at hand. We knew where to, we knew where to go to get stuff. We knew the experts to consult. And um, so, so uh, as we're, you know, viewing this place, um, you know, I turned to Jill and I said, you know, if we can, you know, I'll sell our house to, tomorrow if we can buy this place. This is so cool. Now, we couldn't buy that place, but we did find this place. And this place hadn't been touched since 1959. It, everything was overgrown. The weeds were up to our ears in the fields. And um, it was it was just a mess, but it was also really cool. It had this apartment uh, in the barn that we could fix up and the house was a ruin. And um, so what happened was uh, we went, you know, step by step and we didn't know exactly what we were going to do with it. Um, and at first we thought maybe we'll make this into an events venue. But then we found out a few years in and it took us a few years just to get the place stabilized. Uh, and it took us a year for me to work on the house uh, in order for us to move into the house. So uh, at that point, we said, well, let's make an events venue. But then it comes to licensing, ADA compliance, all kinds of red tape. And it turned out it's just way too expensive. It would cost us $50,000 to be ADA compliant. We can't do that. So um, so what we set, decided was, um, well, let's make it into a writer's retreat because I'm a writer and I know people. Let's do that. And so we we had one, uh, uh, the, the apartment you stayed in, we had that. And so we started renting that out to writers. And then later uh, we, um, we uh, modified a, a former hen house into a really cute cottage and we started renting that out. And we got a lot of traction with that. It was a lot of fun. And so we said, okay, um, you know, let's make this into a nonprofit. And we did that. Um, thanks to Jill, who's a genius at that stuff. I couldn't do that. Um, and so it, 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 by increments, we, we, we grew into it. And so by, uh, by about two years ago, we had it figured out. Uh, it took a little bit uh, of time. So now uh, we're doing programming um, and, uh, and we're really busy with the rentals to writers, but we also write to Air, uh, rent to Airbnb. Um, and, um, and then we built a new building for year round programming. Uh, and this is pretty much my job. Now, this is, this is what I do is, you know, uh, try to try to make the farm beautiful, but also um, directing this, uh, this project, which we hope to grow. And we, now we have a board of directors and all that. So we're, we're, we're a real deal enterprise. Well, Ron, thank you so much for uh, being with us. And this is the book that he read the first story from, Far Rest, Far West Stories by Ron Tanner. If you want to find out more about Ron and his pictures of his cross-country trip and some of his other books, uh, ronaldtanner.com. Uh, thanks once again. And we are now going to shut off the stream on Facebook. Uh, feel free to use the link to read at the open mic. And we are off next week. So thanks, people watching the stream on Facebook. Thanks a lot, Tim. I uh, uh, really appreciate it. And thank you, folks, for hanging out. Take care. Uh,